and thank you Farapa for organizing this webinar. So tonight I'll be talking to you about obstructive sleep apnea or OSA. So the aims of this presentation uh, is to tell you about obstructive sleep apnea, what causes OSA, uh, why it should be detected and treated early, when to suspect you might have OSA, how it is diagnosed, and some uh, tips about the management of OSA. Now we take sleep for granted. In Singapore, we are one of the most sleep deprived countries in the world. Some people cannot fall asleep easily, some people cannot maintain sleep, while others can fall asleep but they have poor sleep quality and they wake up feeling unrefreshed and tired during the day. So sleep deprivation can affect our lives in many ways. It can cause accidents, it can slow down our judgement, it can lead to serious health problems, many of which are chronic, and it can impair sex drive, it cause depression, it can make you look old more quickly because it affects your skin, it causes reduced attention span, weight gain, and it can even lead to early death. So the, there are two main causes of sleep deprivation. One is insomnia, where you cannot fall asleep or cannot maintain sleep. And the second is OSA, where you might have unrefreshed sleep, daytime sleepiness. Now, in patients with OSA, the more they sleep, ironically, the more tired they feel. And this is called the OSA paradox. Tonight's talk, I'll be talking mainly about OSA. I shall not be talking about insomnia. So what is obstructive sleep amnia? It is a sleep breathing disorder due to an obstruction of your upper airway. The upper airway meaning your nose, your soft palate, the throat, the back of the tongue, all the way down to your vocal cords. It is associated with snoring, choking and apnea. Apnea means that you stop breathing for at least 10 seconds. It causes interrupted sleep because of arousals and you often get up to urinate at night. And that's because patients with OSA produce more urine. So this leads to sleep fragmentation, poor quality sleep. The patients wake up feeling unrefreshed, they feel sleepy during the day. And OSA is often associated with middle age, the male gender, obesity, and in ladies who are uh, perimenopausal or postmenopausal. Now, OSA is very common. In this article uh, published by the Straits Times in 2016, uh, a study conducted by the doctors at Ong Teng Fong General Hospital found that about 30% of Singaporeans may have sleep apnea and most patients are not aware of this. So one in three patients have moderate to severe sleep apnea and one in 10 patients may have severe sleep apnea. So this is the article that was uh, uh, published and quoted by the Straits Times. Of patients who have sleep apnea, about 32% are Chinese, 33% are Malay, and about 16% are Indians. And sleep apnea can lead to drug-resistant high blood pressure, obesity, heart failure, and diabetes. So what happens in patients with sleep apnea? So when you sleep, air will enter in through your nose or mouth and it will pass to the back of your nose down uh, through your soft palate behind your tongue and finally down through your vocal cords into your uh, windpipe or trachea so any obstruction to this airflow can lead to snoring this happens when air has to squeeze through a very narrow space and it causes the surrounding soft tissue to vibrate resulting in snoring hypopnea is a condition where the you are still breathing, but the amount of air moving in and out is reduced. 
And apnea is when there's complete obstruction where you stop breathing altogether for at least 10 seconds. So why does OSA happen? Broadly speaking, there are three reasons. One is an anatomical blockage. The second is a reduction of the tone in our muscles of the throat and our tongue when we sleep. And third is because our receptors that sense the carbon dioxide and oxygen in our body becomes less sensitive in OSA patients. So an anatomical obstruction, a patient could have blocked nose, large tonsils, have a small jaw, a big tongue, and the patient may be obese. When you are obese, fat gets deposited in your tongue and the side, muscle, and the side walls of your throat. And this exerts an inward pressure uh, when you lie down and sleep. So here in the photo uh, on the left uh, is a patient with very large tonsils uh, and they are touching one another called kissing tonsils. So a patient like this will have obstruction to the airflow passing from above in the nose down into the throat. On the right side is a picture showing a small room with uh, inappropriately sized furniture. Okay, so similarly in patients with OSA, uh, for example with a large tongue, there's nowhere for the tongue to go except to fall backwards into the airway and block it. Here on the left is a photo of a patient with no obstruction. And you look from above, you can see all the way down through the soft palate into this D-shaped structure below, which are the vocal cords, and down into your windpipe. On the other hand, the photo on the right shows a tongue that is prolapsing backwards, almost touching the back wall of the throat, and this will obstruct the passage of air trying to pass downwards into your windpipe. The second is the loss of tone during sleep. So when we are awake, our throat and our tongue muscles are very active and they keep our upper airway open. When we sleep, the muscles in our throat relaxes. This is especially so when we are dreaming because the brain purposely paralyzes the muscles in our body so that we don't act out our dreams. And this is a protective uh, mechanism. However, it causes uh, excessive uh, relaxation of the muscles in our throat and this tends to fall back and obstruct. So here is a video showing just this patient is uh, sleeping and uh, breathing and you can see the tongue falling back and the side walls of the throat coming together and almost causing total obstruction. The third reason is the chemical sensors in our body that is found in our brain and the blood vessels in our neck I may not be so sensitive in OSA patients. These receptors are important in keeping the oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, constant in our body uh, all the time. When we stop breathing, the carbon dioxide will increase and the oxygen will decrease. And when we breathe, we blow out carbon dioxide and take in oxygen uh, to supply our body with oxygen. So because these receptors are not very sensitive, the oxygen will drop very low and the carbon dioxide will increase. Uh, and it will increase to a point where uh, the, these chemoreceptors are stimulated. Uh, and when these chemoreceptors are stimulated, then it increases the breathing. We call it hyperventilation. So hyperventilation continues for a short period of time until the carbon dioxide drops and the oxygen increases. But when this happens, these receptors do not sense that the carbon dioxide has dropped. So the patient continues to hyperventilate until the point where when it finally stops, uh, the carbon dioxide is low and the patient actually stops breathing for a while and this is called apnea, right? So what happens is 
because the chemoreceptors are less sensitive and there's a cycle of hyperventilation followed by uh, periods where you stop breathing, uh, we call it periodic breathing. And periodic breathing will affect the stability of our airway and it will also cause something called intermittent hypoxia and its effects. Hypoxia is the lack of oxygen in our body. So this is a, looks like a complicated slide, but it's a very important slide and it's not difficult to understand. So intermittent hypoxia will cause a cascade of events. Uh, so the first is sympathetic stimulation. This is the part of our nervous system that responds to stress. So with sympathetic stimulation, our heart rate will increase uh, and our blood pressure will increase. Intermittent hypoxia will also cause damage to the walls of our blood vessels. It will cause the release of free radicals in our body that cause damage uh, to the other end organs. It will cause systemic inflammation through the release of certain proteins called cytokines. So all these things will cause uh, damage to our end organs. It can cause things like high blood pressure, Arrhythmia is irregular heartbeat. It can lead to heart disease and strokes, diabetes, and even joint disease. So all these are chronic diseases that cost money and time uh, to treat. So the whole idea is to avoid uh, getting to the stage where you need to spend a lot of time and money trying to treat these diseases. So this is a summary slide of all the things that can happen when you might have sleep apnea. It can affect almost every single organ in our body. So the reason for picking up OSA early is to prevent all these chronic diseases from happening. So it improves the quality of life and it reduces the burden of care on our society. All right, could you have OSA? Well, you might want to look out for the symptoms that are associated with OSA, such as snoring or choking in your sleep, getting up in the middle of the night to go to the toilet to urinate. Our patients who have difficulty breathing because of the obstruction may wake up with chest discomfort, sweating, sore throat, uh, and headache in the next morning. You may wake up even after seven hours, eight hours of sleep, feeling unrefreshed, and during the day, you feel sleepy. There's a questionnaire called the Stop Bank Questionnaire, which is easily found if you Google it. And this is a self-administered questionnaire. And so this is a questionnaire, okay? Now, STOP stands for snore. Do you snore loudly? Do you feel tired? or sleepy during the day. Has anybody observed you stopping breathing? And P is for, do you have high blood pressure? Bang, B stands for your BMI, if it's more than 35. Your age, if you are middle age, more than 50 years old. Max circumference of 17 inches in males. This corresponds to your collar size, okay? And whether you are of the male gender. So, if you have a score of three or more, you are at risk of sleep apnea, and if you, uh, and and therefore you should seek treatment for this. Now, the standard of diagnosis is to do a sleep study. Okay, there are different ways you can do a sleep study. The first is a full attendance sleep study. Okay, this is this can be done in a laboratory in the hospital. And uh, it can be done with a technician uh, in attendance who is observing the patient's sleep from a separate room. This is uh, important if you suspect that the patient may have something other than sleep apnea, for example, epilepsy or sleep behavioral problems. Um, but the sleep study can be performed without a sleep te technician in the same room as well. Now, you see in this picture, uh, this patient has many wires, some over the forehead, over the nose, the chin, 
and all these wires are going into this box which analyzes all the data. Now, not everyone can sleep uh, with all these wires. So, in patients who cannot fall asleep easily, uh, we have an alternative called the watch pad, which is uh, something that can be administered in your own home. Okay? It is a relatively uh, in, uh, non-intrusive. So this is a, an, an example of a sleep study report. Over here on top are the various stages of sleep. Okay? Uh, over here with a bold bar across is where a patient is dreaming. Now, if you look at the second column, second line, uh, which reflects the oxygenation of the blood, the amount of oxygen in the blood. So the moment the patient stop, uh, starts to sleep, you see that the oxygenation fluctuates greatly. And the fluctuation is greatest when the patient is actually dreaming. The third line over here shows the heart rate. When the patient uh, is awake, the heart rate is quite stable. When the patient starts to dream, and the oxygen fluctuates, the heart rate starts to increase. And this is part of the sympathetic stimulation. The lines below here reflects the times where the patient actually stops breathing. Okay? And you can see how they are clustered and, uh, and how they are related to the drop in oxygen. All right, so how do we decide uh, how to manage the patient? So when you come to the clinic, uh, the main aim is to determine what is the best treatment for you. Uh, not everyone uh, needs to use the CPAP, but not everyone needs to have surgery. There are certain patients that respond better to CPAP and some patients may be treated appropriately with surgery. So we look for things like the site of obstruction. This will determine uh, if, if you do, were to do surgery where are we going to target the surgery? The type of obstruction, whether it's soft tissue or whether it's skeletal. By skeletal, I'm referring to the structure of the jaw and the mid face. Uh, we look at the severity of the sleep amnia. The more severe it is, the more difficult to achieve good surgical success. Uh, we look at the BMI. If your BMI is more than 28, again, surgery may not give such a good outcome. And of course, we take into consideration the patient's preference and the motivation for treatment. So to look at the set of obstruction, we need to do a nasal endoscope. So we uh, anesthetize, anesthetize the nose and put a scope inside to look for the levels of obstruction in the upper airway. Simply put, depending on where the obstruction is, there are different options of treatment available. For example, in the nose, there's the option of using medicine and surgical options. If the obstruction in the upper part of the throat, for example, the soft palate, CPAP, uh, which stands for continuous positive airway pressure device, uh, the use of oral appliances, I'll show you later, and surgery are all uh, options. If the obstruction is in the lower part of the throat, then it's more difficult to achieve good surgical outcome. The use of the CPAP may be the best option. The alternative might be to consider skeletal framework surgery. Now, there are certain things that everyone should observe in order to have a good night's sleep. The first is you should have uh, regular hours of sleep uh, and have the same number of hours every night. Okay, this will uh, avoid being overtired and being overtired predisposes to uh, OSA. You should avoid drinking alcohol because alcohol excessively relaxes the muscles in our throat and causes obstruction. You should avoid sleeping pills uh, or antihistamines that cause drowsiness and tranquilizers before bedtime. Don't smoke, sleep on your side. So 
patients with big tongue, when you sleep on the side, the tongue falls to the side and this reduces the obstruction. Or you can tilt the head up and this again prevents the tongue falling backwards uh, by gravity. So CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. It is the gold standard for OSA treatment. Now the key to having successful CPAP uh, use is the patient must be properly counseled, have good mask fitting and troubleshooting, and attentive sales service uh, after you buy the machine. The problem with CPAP is the acceptance, especially amongst young patients, and compliance, uh, especially if the patient uh, is not very sleepy and not very motivated to continue using a device like this. This is meant to be a long-term uh, solution for sleep apnea. This is how CPAP works. So the, there's an interface with a mask over the nose and it blows air. It's not oxygen. You don't have to buy a tank. You can just use room air. And there's a continuous flow of air through the nose into the uh, upper part of the throat. And this splints open the areas of the throat that tends to uh, narrow down and become closed when we uh, sleep. Oral appliances is something that you wear at night. They look like braces. They advance the jaw forward. And by doing that, it brings forward the tongue it tenses the soft palate and the muscles in your throat. And this um, is appropriate for patients with mild or moderate sleep apnea uh, or uh, patients with, uh, who are relatively uh, non-obese. Now, treating the nose is very important. Let me explain some of the anatomy relating to this. Your nose can be thought of as a house. So you have a roof, all right? So in this uh, uh, picture on the left, you can see the uh, outside of your nose, which is like your roof. And then inside your nose, there are structures. First, there is a partition called the septum. It separates the nose into the right and the left. And there are other structures coming down from the sides uh, over here called the turbinates. These turbinates will warm and humidify the air that we breathe. But the turbinates can also swell uh, in response to sickness, in response to allergy, changes in temperature or humidity. And when the turbinates enlarge, it will block off the space that we have to breathe. Now, treating the nose is important because it contributes about 20% to the resistance of airflow. And having a blocked nose is no fun, uh, especially patients who lie down to sleep at night and cannot breathe, they cannot fall asleep. If you have a blocked nose, there is a negative pressure that is generated uh, up, uh, in your nose, and this negative pressure is transmitted downstream and tends to suck together the muscles in your throat and narrow the space uh, downstream. And having uh, an open nose helps to facilitate the use of CPAP. Now, allergic rhinitis is something that's very common uh, uh, amongst people who live in the tropics. So patients with allergic rhinitis may complain of blocked nose, a runny nose, and sneezing. And this is a recurrent problem. We encourage these patients uh, to undergo allergy testing and the treatment will involve avoiding things that you're allergic to, using nasal steroid sprays, antihistamine tablets, and something called immunotherapy. Now, this uh, photo on the left shows the house dust mite. It's the most common uh, cause of allergic rhinitis. Now, the house, house dust mite will eat the hair and the skin that fall off from our body. So it is common uh, to find these organisms in places where there's high human traffic, such as in our bedroom uh, and our living room. So the hair and the skin that falls off tends to collect 
in areas that have a lot of fabric, for example, our bed sheets, our blankets, uh, and especially if you have a fabric sofa with cushions and carpets. And when these mites uh, feed, uh, they will then defecate, and the fecal particles then enter into our nose and causes allergy, it causes our turbinates to swell. So we can do things like the uh, skin prick test, which looks for allergy to dust mites, cockroaches, and other common things like animal uh, dander uh, and mold. And patients who have dust mite allergies, we give them extensive counselling on how to clean the house, and they have to do this uh, conscientiously to avoid coming into contact. <clears throat> because if you don't clean the house and you just rely on medicine, the moment you stop taking the medicine and you're exposed to the allergen, the problem will start again. So simple things like washing your bed sheets um, every week and hot water, mopping the floor every day if possible, uh, avoiding having uh, fabric so far, uh, minimize the amount of soft toys. If you need to have soft toys, uh, then uh, keep one or two which you can put in the washing machine to wash. These are common examples of nasal steroid sprays. Um, nasal steroid sprays are one of the most effective ways to treat allergic rhinitis. The amount of steroid that is absorbed into the body is very little, so it's actually very safe for long-term use. And this is the proper way to use the nasal steroids with the head looking down at the floor and the, uh, the, the bottle facing upwards and you administer the spray into your nose. All right, so we come to surgical treatment for patients who have persistent blocked nose in spite of using medicine, in spite of avoiding the allergens, uh, there is the surgical option. So the surgical option uh, uh, addresses either the roof, and this is called septorhinoplasty. It addresses the partition, or called septoplasty, or surgery on the turbinates to reduce the size of the turbinates. And this can be done either with radiofrequency or something called turbinoplasty. So this is, uh, on the left, a picture of a patient with a deviated nasal septum. You see the center partition is protruding out and obstructing the passageway on the left side of the nose. And this is the same patient after this obstruction has been removed and the amount of space now is increased. This is a photo of a patient who is uh, undergoing radio frequency of the turbinates. So we pass this electric current called radio frequency which then shrinks and shrivels the turbinate and increases the space. This is a uh, photo, a few photos of turbinoplasty, where we actually remove part of the turbinate uh, and reduce the amount of uh, obstruction. Now, surgery can also be performed on the soft palate. Nowadays, we try and avoid cutting away uh, pieces of the soft palate. We try and put sutures that increases the tension in various, uh, uh, in various uh, ways to increase the space of the upper airway. Now, tongue-based collapse uh, is one of the more difficult uh, things to treat from a surgical perspective. Okay. Uh, it is uh, in, in patients with tongue-based obstruction, CPAP might be uh, the best option. Okay. Now, there are different ways to treat the tongue base with surgery. One is to advance the tongue forward, uh, and one is to reduce the tongue volume. Okay, so this uh, shows different kinds of tongue base obstruction. So the doctor has to identify what kind of tongue base obstruction to recommend the right kind of treatment for you. So on the left, this patient 
uh, the whole tongue is falling backwards. This is uh, a, uh, a loss of tension in this uh, patient, and, and there's not much things on the surface that we can cut away, right? And you contrast this to the uh, picture, to the photo on the right hand side. You see, there are very prominent uh, lymphoid follicles on the surface of the tongue called lingual tonsils. In a patient such as this, you can easily cut away or remove these uh, uh, structures and improve the space for breathing. So, uh, in a patient that requires uh, tongue advancement, you have an operation called the genial glossus advancement where you pull forward the attachment of the tongue. Okay, you cut a little window and you pull forward the tongue. This helps to advance the tongue. Now, the success rate is very variable depending on the size of the tongue, the jaw size, uh, and the size, the, the weight of the patient. And there are technical factors involved in doing this operation. Now, this is another operation which deals with the uh, skeletal structures. So, uh, in this operation, the mid face and the jaw is advanced forward as a unit, and it brings forward the tongue, which is housed uh, in the jaw forward as well. And this is one of the most effective uh, treatment methods uh, for tongue based obstruction. However, it is uh, most patients will consider this rather uh, large surgery. Um, so a lot of counseling needs to be given to the patient before they will embrace such an operation. Now remember the photo on the right hand side where there were large lingual tonsils. Uh, this is an operation that can address that. And this is called coblation lingual tonsillectomy where we use a device called the coblation device to try and uh, shave off and melt away uh, those tissues that are obstructing. So this is that patient that I was showing you with the large lingual tonsils. And this is what it looks like after melting away and removing these lingual tonsils. And it opens up the airway for the patient to breathe. All right, so there are certain take home points here. Number one, OSA is common in Singapore. It is best to treat OSA early because of all the medical morbidity that it is associated with. And these are chronic diseases. You need a sleep study to confirm the diagnosis and there are different management options available. And you should discuss these different options with your doctor. All right, so I've come to the end of my talk. Uh, if you wish to contact uh, me, here are the details. Or you can call the Therapa, um, uh hospital for assistance. Thank you very much.